All right, so I told you guys I went to college, Oral Roberts University down in Tulsa, Oklahoma. When I got to ORU, let's just say it was a struggle for me when I first got there. Um, I, I, I loved ORU. I loved college. I don't necessarily love Tulsa, but loved ORU. But it just felt like a struggle when I got there. And I just, everything seemed more difficult than it needed to be. Uh, my grades were not as good as, which college is a lot harder than high school, which I realized that pretty quick. Um, <laughs> but, but my grades were not what, they, what I thought they were going to be. I had friends, but it just didn't feel like I was, like it was maybe a great fit. Not, not ORU itself, but I just didn't feel comfortable, feel in at ORU or feel, I don't know, something felt off. And so my whole freshman year, I had my lowest GPA that I've ever had, which again, college is harder than high school. So I should have known that and put more work in. But, but it, was, it was a bit of a struggle for me. And I really, I remember kind of just being frustrated. And so now to, I aged myself, I said 2004, right? It was when I graduated high school. When I was in high school, the Fast and Furious movies came out which is still relevant because they're still coming out, right? So I guess I'm not that old, but this was like the first one came out when I was in high school. And I remember that movie came, came out and they had Honda Civics, right? Anybody remember like the first one when they were just street racing and they weren't like solving international crimes and driving cars through buildings and stuff like that? Or didn't they go to space in the last one? So before they were going to space, they were just street racers in LA and they had these Honda Civics and they put a bunch of money into them and made them really fast and really cool, right? So... My first car that I got my senior year in high school was a 99 Chevy Cavalier. Not, not a super fantastic car, not that, not that special, but I thought in my mind, I was like, okay, if Dominic Toretto and these guys can, can do this to Honda Civics, then I can do this to Chevy Cavalier. Um, I quickly realized why they were uh, stealing from those semi-trucks, because it's expensive to, to, put, to put money into a car and make it fast and cool like that. So, so I went down to college, down to ORU, with a very stock, basic 99 Chevy Cavalier. Um, it, was, it was a manual transmission, which was fun, but it wasn't because to go faster. It was try, to try to be more fuel efficient. This car, four-cylinder, it was the most base model car you could possibly get, right? So this is the car that I'm taking down to Tulsa, which is great because it got great gas mileage, and I had a long drive down to Tulsa when I went down there. But it was just a very basic economy car. In fact, I found out, now my mom's watching now, but when you go into Tulsa, there's a, I don't know if you guys, how many guys have been to Tulsa, but you get on the turnpike, I know, <laughs> you get on the turnpike and the speed limit's 75, right? So I found out that my car doesn't like going faster than 80. And so at like, so I wasn't speeding that fast. Although I got a ticket going 90, you knew that already that one time. Um, but, but the car, like, starts to shake when you get over 80 a little bit, right? Um, so why I was going 90, I don't know. That was a bad idea. But I survived. God had me. Thank you for his angels and his protection. Um, but so this car was just, it was, it was good at going slow. It was good at being fuel efficient. It got me down to Tulsa and back several times. It was good for that purpose. So my sophomore year, um, I had to get something fixed on it. And my brother-in-law could work on cars, so he took it for the weekend and was going to do something and let me drive his Mustang. Very different car, all right? Chevys are still better than Fords, don't get confused. But it was, it was a, not just a Mustang, it was something that somebody had put time and money into building this Mustang to go fast. So I was pretty excited that I got to drive his Mustang because it was, in my mind, I was like, it's going to be way better than my Cavalier, this is going to be great. I get the car and I back out of their driveway and I start going down the, the, just the neighborhood roads at like 25 miles an hour. And it's like lobbing, like in between, like it just feels like it's about to die. Like it just doesn't feel right. And I was like, this is the car that they put money into building this engine. And I was like, okay, well, hopefully it's all right. And I don't know, maybe I was doing something wrong. But I took the right turn onto the freeway and hit the gas and I just took off. And I've never gone through the gears so fast in my life. I was... Yes, over 80. Sorry, Mom. I was speeding before I even knew it because that car just was so fast. And it hit me. The Lord hit me, right? He told me that. But it was so clear to me that day that the reason why that car drove so well at higher speeds and so poorly at lower speeds is because it was built for speed. That's what it was designed to do. That's what it was created to do. 
my Cavalier was not created for speed. It's created for fuel efficiency. It was created to get you there, right? So it quickly, what God told me is like, if you're not in your purpose, it's gonna feel off. It's gonna feel weird. It's not gonna feel good. It's gonna be uncomfortable. And that's why I felt uncomfortable my first year at ORU. That's why it was difficult. Not that uncomfortable, I mean, it's gonna be ha- happen where, you, where you're tested and you're trialed and things will happen. But I just felt out of place there and I wasn't comfortable and things weren't going as smooth as I felt like they should have been. And God told me, because outside of your purpose, life's gonna feel like that. And if you're built for, and I'm not saying some of you are Cavaliers and some of you are Mustangs, I'm saying you are designed for a specific purpose and you're not gonna be satisfied in life. You're not gonna be content. You're not gonna be happy. You're not gonna enjoy life like God wants you to outside of that created purpose, right? Every one of you was created for a specific purpose and you will not be content or satisfied in life outside of that purpose. So, so when, when God hit me with that, and it, and it clicked for me in college. I went back, I changed my major, I prayed, I talked to God, was like, what am I supposed to be doing? If this isn't right, what am I supposed to be doing? And I want to show you a video, if you guys have that back there, of my mentality switch at that time. If you have the video. When you have the video, play it for me. You guys seen this one? So watch, look at this dog, focused on that hockey puck. So focused on that puck. All that other stuff goes past him. He doesn't care. He's only focused on that puck. Like, that's incredible. Right? My brother-in-law trains dogs for a living, so he probably knows about how to do that and all that stuff. And a special breed of, I mean, German Shepherds are dogs that can do something like that. But, but so that was my goal. I was like, this is my purpose. This hockey puck is my purpose. I'm going to focus on that and let everything else go by. I was just so focused on what I felt like God had created me to do. You guys are probably familiar with the verse Jeremiah 1.5. Before I formed you in, in you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I ordained you a prophet to the nations. So you guys have probably heard that before, but I'm telling you, it clicked for me at that moment that you were created for a purpose. And not just, we, we're all created, but we're created for a specific purpose, for a specific reason. If you were, if you were created on purpose, you were created for a purpose. I'm telling you, God, God knew what he was doing when he put you together. It's not an accident the why, why you are the way you are. So like I said, I, I changed my major, I pursued purpose, and just tried to stay locked in like that dog. I was like, I'm gonna be this, I'm gonna focus on this purpose, what I believe I'm called to do. Your purpose, if you were created for a purpose, and God formed you together for this specific purpose, like he says in Jeremiah 1.5, then Your purpose is found in your identity and who you're created to be. I think this is why identity is such an is in such attack. I think it's not just me. It's not just it's not a new this generation thing. The devil attacks identity because that's where your purpose is. Because that's who God created you to be. And I, I heard someone say one time, and it's so true that when the devil tempted Jesus in the wilderness, he attacked his identity if you are the son of God. Like, that's what he was trying to get Jesus to question. And and to us, it might sound like, well, of course, he's the son of God. Well, we've read the book. We know the story. We know how it ends, of course. But if Jesus truly did come in human form, he probably had questions too, or at least there there was a possibility for him to have questions too. So the devil attacked his identity. So the devil will attack, especially young people, he will attack your identity and who you are and he does that because that's where you find your purpose. So if you were created for a purpose, then you, first of all, you got to know you were created, right? And then you were created for a purpose, and each thing about you is part of that purpose. I, I truly believe that God made us all unique on purpose because he has a unique plan and purpose for your life. So you are not, even though we're all created in the image of God, you're not like other people. You're not like anybody else. And especially younger and even now, I mean, I'm plenty old. We don't, you guys can do the math, graduate 2004. But even now I struggle with identity and I struggle with, with trying to fit in. And I think so, so, so many of us try so hard to fit in because we think we should be like this group over here or like these people over here. 
but you're not gonna fit in. You're never gonna be like everybody else because God didn't design you to be like other people. He designed you specifically for your purpose and your purpose is different than the person sitting next to you. Your purpose is different than those other people that you're comparing yourself to. Okay, I have a, object lessons are a little bit cheesy, I think. But they help me. So I have a little bit of an object lesson. So if my lovely assistant, Jocelyn, can start with the basketball. So you guys, if you guys know me, you know sports was gonna be somehow a part of what I was doing. Um, but this is a basketball. Seen some, some rough days. I hit the rim a lot. Doesn't, I don't get a lot of nothing but nets. Usually it's breaking off the backboard. or But that's okay. God still loves me. So, um, so this is a basketball. And if I tell you in general, like, think of a ball, draw, you tell a kid, draw a ball, uh, you think of it's round, right? Most balls are round. Basketball is round. You can dribble it. You can shoot it. But there is a ball that's not round. See, this, I, know it's, I know it's super simple, but in my mind, it's, it's an image that sticks with me. And so a football is not round because a football does not need to bounce. You don't dribble a football. A football has a more aerodynamic shape because you throw it. Even the laces on the football are there for a purpose. That's where you figure out where you're going to put your fingers. Different quarterbacks have different grips on a football. But it's a simple analogy, but they're similar, right? They're both filled with air. They look pretty similar, the textures of them. Um, but a football is designed to be different because it has a different purpose than a basketball. You may be similar to even like your siblings sitting next to you, but you have a different purpose, so you're going to be different than them. God created you different, and just like this football was created, not just different to be different. They didn't make a football weird shaped because they thought it would be funny. I don't know. Like, there's a purpose for it, right? It's not on accident. You were not created on accident. The things that God put inside of you are not on, were not on accident. Okay, so the best way to learn about a football, if you really wanted to learn all the details, you talk to the person that designed it, that made it, right? If you want to learn about yourself, talk to your creator. Spend time with God and, and find out what he made you for, why he made you, the unique things about you. And I, I just really encourage you to, to get to know yourself. And as someone who is introverted and who is a, you know, an internal processor, I'm very good at like spending time getting to know myself. I know some people are more external processors and they're like talking to all the time, which is great. If you're an extrovert, love it. Good for you. Um, but, but I think even, even if that's not your, your bent, I think you should still, I really encourage you to spend time alone with God and get to know yourself. Understand your strengths and weaknesses. Understand what God gave you specifically, okay? So learn about your purpose. Talk to God. Find out. Because I, I truly believe that everything about you your, your, your talents, obviously, your giftings, but your likes, your dislikes, if you're an introvert or an extrovert, your personality traits, I truly believe those are God-given for your specific purpose, right? And I'm not saying that, that you're, we all got stuff we got to work on, right? God does, does want you to improve, but he doesn't want you to be a different person. He created you that way. He wants you to be the best version of you, the best version of what he created you to be, so everything, I, I struggle sometimes with, like I said, I am introverted a little bit. There's some things about my personality that I don't love that I think are difficult, but I truly believe that God gave me that as part of my purpose. Uh, I said I'm an internal processor. Sometimes that goes into overthinking. We're working on that, right, Jocelyn? Um, but, I, but I am an internal processor. I think about things. I plan things ahead of time. That's, yes, there are times when I'm like, oh, I, wish, I wish I didn't overthink. I wish I didn't have to deal with this. But I believe that God put that inside of me for a reason, and, and it's not something I need to just completely ignore. I need to work on it, maybe. I need to get better about not worrying and, not, and deal with my anxiety or anything. But God made me someone who thinks more and plans ahead of time and plans more. I think that's absolutely God-given. God you know, one of the reasons why I feel like I'm called to do some of the speaking, to do, you know, I try to podcast. I've done some videos. I was a, a TV reporter for a few years. I think I'm, I'm better at like interviews and having these conversations where you have to prepare because I have to prepare for every conversation I ever had. So I had this conversation with some friends the other day. I, I literally, because of 
because I'm an introvert. Some of you guys might not know that about me because I'm comfortable in the situation or whatever, but I prepare for conversations. So if I'm going to talk, even if I'm friends with you and I know you, like Pastor Dustin, you might not know this, but if I know I'm going to talk to you, I plan for it. Like I prepare in my head like what I'm going to say. So, so for me, when I have to prepare for what I'm going to say here or, or for an interview, we've, you know, we've done some videos with the church where I've done interviews with people, and I, I'm used to kind of preparing for those conversations because that's what I do in life. And I remember um, we, were, we were having a, it was a young adults thing actually a few years ago, and I remember, I could probably say her name, Alana. You guys, I don't know if you guys know Alana or not, but she's an extrovert, very much so. And... I remember having a conversation with her. We were talking with like kind of our volunteer leadership team about, you know, like greeting new people and that kind of stuff. And I asked Alana, like, what do you say? Like, because she was very good at like going up and talking to random people and making friends with just everybody. I was like, what do you say? Like, what do you, what do you plan out? What are you thinking? When, what, what's a good like icebreaker question? She was like, I don't know. I just talk. I was like, what do you mean just talk? Like, it blew my mind. I was like, how do you not have a plan? Like, how do you just go into that? But I, I truly believe that's, that's given to me God-given and I think that's on purpose. And that's, and even, you know, some of these things that, that I might not love about myself, I still think are God-given. Like some of that stuff can be annoying and I wish some things were different. But even the stuff you don't like about yourself can be God-given. That's why I say to, to search internally for, for strengths and weaknesses, but talk to your creator about what's actually a strength and what's actually a weakness. Because sometimes there's things in our lives that we think are weaknesses, but God actually wants to use that as a strength. I have an example here, and actually Pastor Dustin and I were talking on Sunday, and he was telling me about, and I'd heard about him before, but he reminded me of this kicker, um, Tom Dempsey, I believe his name is, we got a picture of him, um, he, he, for a long time, had the record for the longest field goal in NFL history, right, I like I liked the stash and the long hair, I just thought that was a good, so in 1970, which I think is about when this picture was, I think that captures 1970 pretty well. I wasn't there. Dad, is that, is that about right for 1970? That's, a, that's, a, that's the look. That's, the, that's about, were you married in 78? Yeah, you had the stash. Probably wasn't as thick like that. But, all right. So in 1970, uh, he kicked the longest field goal in NFL history. And it stood for like 50 years. It was a 63-yard field goal. If you can go to the next picture, this is him like in action kicking. Okay, um, great, great form, fantastic. You can't, and some of you can tell, maybe you already know who this guy is, but if you show the next picture, so Tom Dempsey was born without toes on his right foot. So this guy had, on his dominant foot, did not have toes, yet he pursued a career as a professional kicker. Like, that's not what I would have done. I'd have been like, I don't have toes, like, you could easily cross that off your list. Like for me, when I'm thinking about what I was created to do, what God's called me to do, the gifts he's given me, like I crossed off music like real early. Like I got no musical ability. I cannot sing. I can't, like I knew right away I was not called to lead worship. Praise the Lord for those of you that are. You guys are fantastic. You're talented. That was not my calling, right? Uh, professional sports. When I was a kid, I wanted to be a professional athlete, but I found out fairly quickly that that wasn't going to happen either. Um, but I held on to that dream a couple of years later because I at least tried, I don't know, when I was, I feel like a lot of kids want to be professional athletes. But, but here's this guy who should have probably crossed off professional kicker right away. He was born without toes. So like right away, you know how many people probably discouraged him from trying to kick in the NFL? And he was like, no, I'm going to, even though it's a perceived weakness, I'm going to turn it into a strength. And he was a, a great a great kicker. He just passed away a couple of years ago, but was, was a phenomenal kicker. Held the record, like I said, for almost 50 years of the longest field goal in NFL history. And he was born without toes. So what is it in your life that you think is a weakness, that you think is holding you back, that God's like, no, actually, that's the very thing that I want to use to change the world, to make a difference, right? So don't, don't limit yourself. When I say get to know yourself, don't limit yourself to what you think is a weakness. Talk to your creator and find out why. You know, some people, when I come back to the shape of this football, some people might think the shape is a weakness because it doesn't bounce like a basketball. If you try to dribble a football, it's going to go all over the place, right? So you might see it as a weakness, but you don't realize that it was designed to be thrown. It wasn't designed to be dribbled like this basketball is. (laughs) 
So another sports example real quick, sorry, but you guys know Steph Curry, right? You got to at least know the name Steph Curry. He's my favorite player right now in the league. And if, if you know anything about basketball, the guy has a God-given talent to shoot the basketball. That was absolutely part of what he was created and designed to do. I'm not saying basketball was his whole purpose. Please don't get it twisted. Do not think that if you are good at basketball, then your sport is your only purpose of life because you can get yourself in trouble when you put your identity in one thing, whether it's sports or music or math or whatever it is that you're good at. But my favorite Steph Curry story, before he was an MVP, before he was a champion, this guy, oh, I need some help with this. Okay, can you hold the mic for a second? So Steph, sorry. So Steph Curry was, no, we didn't practice. Sorry, guys. Uh, he, when he was a little kid, so his dad played in the NBA, so he wanted to play basketball, but he was small. So he shot like this. You guys ever seen a little kid shoot a basketball? And they're like down like this, and they throw it. So that's how Steph Curry learned to shoot. Thank you, Jocelyn. Isn't she amazing? So that's how Steph Curry learned to shoot. And so as he got older, he continued to shoot from down here. His dad, who played in the NBA, Del Curry, played in the NBA for a number of years, told him when he was in high school, he said, Steph, if you want to get to the next level, if you want to play where I played, you can't shoot like that. Your shot's going to get blocked every single time. You have to, fit, you have to be able to bring the ball up. You, I won't make you come up again. But you have to be able to bring the ball up here and shoot normal. You have to be able to shoot like that because you can't, you can't bring it down here. So he was a sophomore in high school, and his dad told him that. And he spent his entire sophomore year completely remaking his jump shot. He com he, and he said that he, he would move in to close to the rim, even though he was a shooter, right? That's, that's been his gifting. He's a shooter. He moved in close to the rim and just shot like that over and over again. Spent countless hours in the driveway and in the gym learning that shot. He said it was the most difficult summer of his life. He said he went to basketball camps, like invite camps for like other good players in the city, in the state. And people like laughed at him. He said it was the most embarrassing thing ever because he couldn't shoot because he was remaking his jump shot. How many of you guys know that worked out all right for Steph Curry, right? <laughs> Thank God that he spent the time that he did in the gym working on that jump shot. Not, not just so he can be a great basketball player and win championships. That's awesome. But if you know Steph Curry, he's very vocal about his faith. And he uses the platform of basketball to share his faith and bring people to Christ and introduce people to the Lord. And, how, and that's amazing. That's, that's his God-given ability. So one, he had a God-given ability. He was created to play basketball. Two, he developed that ability. And now he's using that to bring God glory. Like, that's the dream. I know, I know for all of us, some of us maybe can shoot like Curry. I know not all of us can, so we might have to find something else. Um, but but he, he put in the work, he remade his jump shot, became an MVP, became a champion. So being a sports fan myself, knowing the story, I'm like, I'm going to be like Steph Curry. I'm going to put in the work, not like basketball, but I'm going to put in the work. I have some things that I want to accomplish in life. So I'm going to pursue that purpose like that dog, right? Just, just focus on purpose, not let anything distract me. In 2019, my wife and I moved back from California, back home, and I... At the end of 2019, I was set on like, okay, this is it. We're back home. We went to California, lived on the beach for a couple of years. It was great. It was fun. At least for me. She was working a lot. For me, it was fun. I was at the beach. Um, but I'm like, okay, God called us to come back home. I'm going to put in work. I'm going to pursue my purpose. This, this is the year. I was like, 2020 is going to be my year, right? Okay. So <laughs> I don't know some of you guys. 2020, we'll talk about that. But 2020 was going to be my year. And I was like, I, I was praying about like, what is, what is 2020 going to be? I was like, I'm going to come up with a word and that word is pursue. And I told God, 2020 is going to be my year of pursuit. And not always a good idea to try to tell God stuff, but it was funny because God was like, okay, yeah. I was like, oh, I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't, I wasn't expecting God to agree with me. Um, but he said, yes, you can, you can make 2020 a year of pursuit, but I'm going to tell you what you're going to pursue, and you got to pursue it in this order. And I was like, okay, I think I can do that. So these are the four things that God told me that I need to pursue in 2020. Now, 2020 obviously didn't go the way any of us planned. Five days into 2020, we lost a good friend. Um, a lot of you guys know him. I, we, a lot happened. A lot of people lost people. We had race riots, the city on fire. 2020 was not a great year. So... I, I let these resolutions roll over for a few years, um, and I haven't gotten them right anyway, so it's going to take me a while probably, um, but these are the four things that God told me to pursue in 2020 and beyond at this point. First thing he said is to pursue his presence. 
First thing you should do, first most important thing, Bible says seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and then all these things will be added to you. First thing, pursue his presence. He said, be intentional about spending time with me. That was the first thing before anything else. Number two, he said, pursue his people. This is incredibly important because I believe whatever you're called to do, you're called to the people that you're with. And I think you can never get too big to be good to people. You can never be too busy to be good to people, to take the time and see people. I think of Jesus um, with the woman in the issue of blood, and he's on his way to heal someone, uh, she, but he stops, and he touch, when she touches him, he stops, and he looks at her and sees her, and the disciples are like, oh, no, there's a lot of people touching you. We got to keep moving. We got to keep moving. And he said, no, I'm going to see this woman. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to this woman. I'm going to heal this woman. He was never, even Jesus was never too busy to stop and see people. So pursue his people, make a difference in their life. The third thing is to pursue peace. Peace does not hop, happen automatically, especially if you're like me, an overthinker. You worry. Peace does not happen. I got some amens. Peace does not happen automatically. I know some people um, just live a carefree life and just do whatever they want, and that's fine. Um, but for me, you, I have to pursue peace. Um, there's a great message that came out about the same time. It was from Elevation Church. It wasn't Stephen Furtick, but it was somebody else, a different pastor on staff, called Chasing Contentment. I highly encourage you to look that up if you deal with, with anxiety, with worry. Chasing Contentment. It was, it was about the end of 2019 is when that happened. Um, message was fantastic. And then the fourth thing he said is to pursue your passion. So after you've done those things, pursued the presence of God, pursued his people, pursued peace, now pursue your passion. Because what you're passionate about is what you were designed to do, right? If there's, and, and I mean that in, in music, I mean that in sports, I mean that in, in school and academics, but I also mean that in like, if you look around the world right now and you find something that just bothers you, you were probably called to fix that. You were probably called to make a difference in that area, right? Whatever it is, and you can look around, you, we can name a whole bunch of stuff that's, that's wrong with the world right now, so I'm sure you can find something. But, but what I found in talking to different people is there's things that just, just bother them. They're like, how can this happen? And other people are just like, I don't even think about that. If, if it's something like that bothers you, and I don't care if you are young or old, if, if something like that bothers you, then you should do something about that. God has probably called you and created you specifically to do something about that. Pursue your passions, okay? Because what I found out here in 2020 was that purpose is not a final destination. It's a pursuit. I, I was looking at, at, at purpose like that hockey puck, and I was like, that's my purpose. I need to get there. I need to focus on that. And what, what God taught me in 2020 and what my lovely wife, reminds me of almost daily, maybe more so, is that purpose is not something out there at the end of your life before you die. Purpose should be right now. You have a purpose in every season of your life, and your purpose is that pursuit. Pursuing those four things, that's your purpose. That's why you're on this earth, to pursue God, to pursue his people, to pursue peace, and to pursue your passion. So, I think of, of, I thought of purpose, and when I need reminding, Acts 13, 3, it says, now when David had served God's purpose on his earth and his own generation, he fell asleep and he's buried with his ancestors. So I'm like, yeah, that's my, you, if you wait for your purpose at that point, then what do you do for the rest of your life? Like, what are you doing? So you just, like that, like, the, like those cars outside when you're just uncomfortable your whole life because you're not in your purpose yet? And so that's, that's what really this pursuit of purpose. So we're talking about purpose today, but I titled this message, The Pursuit of Purpose. Because purpose is not about the final destination. Your purpose is the pursuit. In every, in every day of your life, you should be pursuing purpose, right? Because you're, you're, the purpose literally is the pursuit. I'm saying that a lot now. But, but I really, I do want to drill that in though. The pursuit is the purpose. And you have purpose in every season of your life, I think when you're young, you're like, oh yeah, I'll have purpose down there. Or my purpose is, is at the end when I graduate, when I have money, when I do this, then I'll give back. And then I feel like when you're older, you're like, oh, I missed my purpose or my purpose was back there and now it's too late or whatever. But, but I'm telling you right now, God has purpose for you in every season of your life. The youngest person in here, the oldest person in here, if you're breathing, if you're here, God has purpose for you. And you need to pursue that. 
you need to pursue purpose in every season of your life. It's one thing San Diego taught me when we were out there was, was about seasons. And I, and I stopped thinking of life um, in time and limitations, all right? Because when we moved to San Diego, I had no idea for how long. People would ask, what are, you, are you guys going to stay out there? You know? It's like, I don't know. I know for this season, God called us to live in San Diego. So when I was there, we were purposeful about pursuing what God had for us in that season because we didn't know how long it was going to last. We had no idea. And then when we moved back to Minnesota, days like today make me wonder why, but God had a reason for us for the purpose, right? Because it's cold, not because of this. I love being up here, just for the reference. It's cold outside. San Diego is not that cold. Um, but, he, but, he, but he had a purpose for us in this season while we're back. And, and I pray that I don't miss that. And I pray that, that every day that I pursue what purpose he has for me in this season. And I think in this season, it's those four things that are going to be a part of your purpose, of his purpose for you in this season in every season, pursue the presence of God. If things are good, seek God. If things are bad, seek God, right? You can never go wrong seeking God. You can, ne- you can always, always find time, make time to seek God, to pursue his presence. Second thing is his people. In every season of your life, there are people in your life that might only be for that season, and you have a God-given priority to be Jesus to those people, to love those people, to impact those people. And it might be, you know, one thing when we moved back to San Diego, back from San Diego, we're closer to family. And so we were, we we're like, we're going to get to every kid's birthday party. We're going to go to, you know, baseball games and basketball games. And they can play a lot of sports. Going to their games and being a part of the family. Because in that season, we could be with family. And we knew that those people were people that we were called to in this season. So whether your season is your family, who you're pretty much called to for life, right, whether you want to or not, or your classmates because you're in high school and you only have a couple years with them, or maybe it's people at your job and you're there for however long you might be at your job, or maybe, maybe it's, it's the person checking you out at Target and you got two minutes with them, how can you impact their life? And for the record, it doesn't have to be a long conversation because introverts, we don't necessarily like that, but if you smile, say something nice, um, you can have an impact on their life in a simple way, right? How can you impact these people? Because I, I firmly believe there is nothing more important on this earth than people. And the people that God put in your life for the season that you're in right now. So I'm going to wrap up with this, but I want to I kind of give you a summary. I want to remind you that you were created for a purpose that your purpose is found in your identity and who God created you to be, but your purpose is not your final destination, it's that pursuit. Purpose is the pursuit, and pursue purpose in every season of your life. This is so important because if 2020 and the last couple of years taught us anything, taught us what's important, the people in our lives, taught us that we don't really necessarily have time to wait for a purpose somewhere down here. You need to find purpose in this season. And, and purpose could mean a lot of different things in a lot of different seasons, but I just want to encourage you to, to seek purpose down there. Yes, absolutely. Especially if you're young and you're like, where do I go to college? What job do I do? Absolutely seek God about those things. But in the season you're in right now, whatever season you're in, if you are alive, if you can hear me, if you have breath in your lungs, pursue purpose in this season today.